What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the PicSwap Media YouTube channel. My name is Sean Bernard. Uh, as usual, coming off a heartbreaking loss, a bad day in Philly sports history, a rough day to be a Philly sports fan, coming off the Super Bowl loss by the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, we'll get more into that later this week with a couple different guys on this channel. But for me here today, I am here to talk about the Sixers' recent signing of Dwayne Dedman. Uh, some further reasons to be pessimistic in my mind, unfortunately, but ready to get into it. Let's go. All right, so before we kick things off, let's get into a little bit of who Dwayne Dedman is. And let's look at the positives here. His, he is a nine-year NBA vet, been around the league for a while, bounced around to a couple different teams, most recently played for the Miami Heat, did his damage mostly with the Atlanta Hawks. These highlights on the screen here or from 2018-19. These are the most extensive highlights that I kind of could find from Dwayne. Shout out to Hoops Intellect for him because he kind of hasn't played that much of late, and there is probably a reason for that. So before we get fully into it, let's look at the positives. We see him dicing up on the Sixers here, some nice pick and roll. He is a real deal center, and the Sixers do lack that on the roster. He is seven feet tall. He's a pretty skilled big man. He has a legitimate float game. He's got some pick and pop potential. Offensively, he's more talented and more legitimate of a center than they currently have. He's more true of a center than the six foot seven Montrezl Harrell, more true of a center than whatever you want to call B ball Paul positionally. He's a guy that is real deal seven foot, and he's be. The only player outside of Joel Embiid that now eclipses six foot nine on the Sixers roster. So that is a positive. And like I said, the skill is there. He has a little bit of a bag offensively. I don't mean that he's going to go out there and create his own shot by any means, but he's got a nice little push shot around the rim that I think will be useful in the pick and roll. He can space the floor. He's had a growing uh, shot diet of a three pointer uh, throughout his career. Let's look at his stats for this season. Not his best performance. Uh, averaging just 11.7 minutes where he's producing 5.7 points, 3.6 rebounds, shooting 29.7% on three-pointers. And that's a little bit of a dip from what he's been known to produce for his career. Uh, through his career, he's averaging 17.4 minutes, producing 6.4 points, 5.8 rebounds, just 0 0.8 blocks, but he is shooting 33.5% on three-pointers, uh, 1.2 attempts per game. That's a decent attempt for a guy who's a rotational uh, big man. He's never been a guy that's been a true like starting caliber. He's always been more of a rotation piece, but he has kind of adjusted with the modern NBA and added that perimeter type of shot to his game in somewhat of an effective manner. Unfortunately, I do think he could be closer to the DeAndre Jordan, Anthony Tolliver, Greg Monroe, Paul Millsap, the names on top of names of guys that are just simply past their prime when they get to the Sixers. And Deadman, there's some strong indicators for just him not looking himself and him not looking like the player that has proven to be a legitimate backup big in the NF in the NBA. Uh, looking at it with the Heat this year, the Heat were 11.9 points per game worse when Deadman was on the court this season per 100 possessions. In comparison, the Sixers have been 3.4 points worse with Montrezl Harrell on the court. And the defense is a concern. Looking at the month of December, which is pretty much the uh, – the just absolute bottom, I don't even know how, the best way to word this, but just the, the pit of Dwayne Dedman's performance this year. In December, he played 45 total minutes on the floor for the Heat. During that month, they were minus 34 with an 80.6 offensive rating and 114 defensive rating. Opponents are also shooting 78.5% at the rim and 48% 48% in the short mid. That rim protection to me is probably the highlight for my biggest concern for him. He's just not that gifted as a rim protector, which I think is extremely important for a team when Joel Embiid is not off the court for the six to have a guy to be able to step in and do that. The defense is a concern, not a rim protector. <clears throat> also has some slow feet around the perimeter. We see this with Montrez Harrell often where he kind of gets singled out in pick and roll coverage. There's a little bit of that in Dwayne Dedman too. Uh, the guys, that's going to be put to the test in the postseason. He's a little bit exploitable in that, and that's not good news. That's not something you want to see. And uh, so when you're looking at kind of the balance, which there always is for these backup big men, there's always some sort of hole and something they're not great at. Because if they were perfect, if they could do it all, they would be starters, and they wouldn't be floating out there, and they definitely wouldn't be in the buyout market, which is where Dwayne Dedman was got for a veteran's minimum. 
Uh, there's that little push shot, by the way, that I was kind of talking about by Dwayne. He has a nice little uh, ability there. But defensively, I, I, I am worried. I'm, I am worried what there is going to be. And I guess it brings up the bigger question of how we got here. Looking at this roster spot, what was sold to the Sixers team was the decision to cut Isaiah Joe and Charles Bassey. Charles Bassey, who I might argue would already be better than Dwayne Dedman straight up, and Isaiah Joe, who is leading the NBA in three-point percentage. And I get all the arguments of, like, these Sixers don't have time to let Joe play through his growing pains, that he's much better on a rebuilding team with the Thunder, which is absolutely true. He's got more of an opportunity for that. But if the Sixers can't find a way to get the NBA's best three-point percentage within the rotation, that's pretty telling in itself, and that's an issue, and that's something that is pretty in, in pretty much an indictment of their roster, their coaching, and their just overall construction and belief in their developmental system. So that's frustrating. So we ended up releasing two young, talented players who have a bright future ahead of them for this financial flexibility for this cap room, and it turns out to be this guy, Dwayne Dedman, who is fine. He's a backup big. He's he's pretty much what you look for in a backup big, but he's old and there's no guarantee that he is the guy. There's been plenty of rumors of Nerlens Noel looking like that was going to be the target. There's not an unclear indication that he is going to be bought out by the Detroit Pistons. I would assume that's probably the holdup, although it doesn't make any sense for the Pistons to hold on to him considering they just traded for James Wiseman. They already got Jalen Duran. They already got Isaiah Stewart. And Nerlens Noel wasn't even really playing before the Wiseman trade, so... I guess they're going to hold on to him money-wise. It's a pretty significant cap hit, so that might have to do with the, the buyout market. He's sitting around a little over $9 million, uh, between 9 and $10 million. So a little bit of a lot to swallow there for Detroit. But that would have been a much uh, an option that I would be much more excited about for the Sixers here. And I guess this also proves this is putting more responsibility on Doc Rivers because Deadman is not the cure-all backup big that the Sixers really need. He's another guy that, depending on the matchup, could be impactful but you got to pull the right string. So now looking at what the Sixers legitimate backup options are and the backup center uh, backup center position, a lot of people have diminished, but these Sixers have been burnt on this year after year after year for not having the proper guys to back up Joel Embiid. And for many teams, backup center is not that big of a deal. I think Daryl Morey came into the Sixers with that mentality. He has actively downplayed that on podcasts like the Rice to Ricky Sanchez podcast talking to the media about like they're only playing a couple minutes per game it's not make or break but it absolutely can be and the reason it's the case with these Sixers is because Joel Embiid is the most important player on both sides of the court for this team so when he steps off the court somebody has to fill that and rather than a, a team like if you take it back to like a Houston team where Maury took control of it's not that big of a deal when you when Clint Capella steps off the floor because Clint it just, just doesn't have that high of usage to him he He's going to catch lobs. He's an, he was an important player for them, no doubt, but you can kind of plug and play that way more. That's not the case when the Sixers team because Joel pretty much runs the offense. It touches it, it touches his hands every possession. He patrols the paint. He calls out the sets defensively. He's the most important player on both sides of the ball, so you just can't have the run-of-the-mill backup center because the run-of-the-mill backup center can't fill that. And yes, when you stagger lineups, when you have guys like James Harden stepping up, being able to, to pull some of that, it does change it a little bit. But the bottom line is, like, when your your star steps off, you can't just, like, treat it as if it's a, a no big deal because it's not, and the Sixers have been burnt like that. So I guess my my point being that Doc Rivers now has to find a way to stagger this to figure out what's right. We've seen Montrez Harrell be incredibly limited in the postseason. It's been very frustrating, the version of Montrez that has come to the Sixers. He looks super washed for being 29 years old, and it's disappointing because he's a guy who's been electric to watch, a guy who I've personally been very much a fan of throughout his career, dating back from the Louisville days, but he's just lost a step. He doesn't have that explosion anymore. He's not a lob threat anymore, which was a key part of his game in that pick and roll, and he still gets up there. He'll still have his dunks when there's nowhere around and hang on the rim and shake and scream and yell, which is awesome, but he used to be a guy who had enough of an offensive ability and some creation and could do things that it made up for the lack of defensive impact and that's not there anymore so now we're getting that double negative of not having enough offensively and pretty much being a non-factor defensively he's only six foot seven which is struggle uh Dwayne Dedman I will say is a very good defensive rebounder that is a big deal that's something the Sixers need uh, a little bit over 27 percent of a defensive rebounding percentage throughout his career which is pretty good that's that's something you look for that's a positive Paul Reed it's it feels like once Paul Reed starts to do positive is when the Sixers just got to find a way to bury him. And that's how it's been. He's played very well lately. He's gotten the backup center run these past two games uh, against the Nets, against the Knicks. And he's looked good. Paul Reed, he does his thing. He's still incredibly raw. He's not the cure-all either. He's definitely another player 
that is a niche player matchup base where there's going to be nights where he's very useful and nights where he doesn't belong on the floor. But this is further responsibility that's being thrown onto Doc Rivers, thrown onto Doc Rivers to decide when those nights are and have the trust and have the ability and have the knowledge to be able to do this. So uh, it is what it is. The Sixers backup center issue for the time being is now kind of finalized. Uh, Dwayne Dedman will fill that 15th roster spot. If there is some sort of other decision, if some sort of other movement, whether it's they, they reach an agreement to move on from Furkan Korkmaz, who who uh, moved, who moved requested a trade, did not get it. Teams have until March 1st to truly finalize those rosters. But this really could be it for the Sixers. This isn't that missing piece, something that I was that excited about. But it is what it is. We're going to take it. We're going to see. Hopefully, Dedman can turn back the clock look a little more youthful for the Sixers team. From an ability standpoint, it's not the worst move in the war, but from the aspect of does he have anything in the tank, it's not the most convincing. There's plenty of reason to indicate that he is on that downhill. Let's hope that's not the case. Let's hope it turns it back, but we will see when he takes the court again. Thank you guys for tuning in. Appreciate you guys for watching. Drop a comment. Let me know your thoughts. Let me know who you would have rather the Sixers gone out to. Uh, there's plenty that I think you can probably list on there, so I'm excited to hear your thoughts, but appreciate all you guys, and I'll talk with you next time.